Hello everybody, welcome to More Chainsaws Needed, where, because I love horror, thrillers and suspense, I am going to talk, rant, rave about, review and recommend movies, TV series and books in those genres for you guys as I draw. Last time we were talking about how deep, deep down, the hillbilly horror genre is completely sustained by the fear of the other, with said other being the lower class for the middle class audience. This, of course, has its own deal of issues of stereotyping and creating a divide, but given when it was created, it was to be expected. After all, the early 50s were the time when the middle class was firmly established and the status quo needed to be king. But times are changing, as Bob Dylan would say, and thus, more and more people are realizing that the ones who are creating more crime more poverty and more problems, not just for the middle class, but for everyone not in the 1%, are the rich. The other side of the scale. And thus, little by little in an entertainment, we're getting more and more evil rich men. This started all the way back to It's a Wonderful Life and created a whole genre of 80s movies where the plucky kids in town had to find a way to get money to stop the greedy CEO from destroying the community center, or in the case of the Goonies, the town itself, and save everyone's ways of life. But in horror, it seemed that we were a bit behind. Well, unless we count Scooby-Doo, when we learned really, really early on that all spooks were usually a rich white man in a costume trying to become richer. Of course, this was just a question of perspective. Because the evil rich guy in horror has a long, long history that starts way, way before movies. After all, Dracula was a rich aristocrat who fed on the blood of the people. But in movies, we can start tracing it from the original The Most Dangerous Game back in 1932, where a rich guy was so rich that he thought that he could hunt poor people for sport and get away with it. An unfortunately very common idea among the rich, even if hunt is not literal. Ready or not, continues that idea of the depraved rich, only that this time it also makes fun of them. Because see, usually the rich on those dangerous game that kills you movies are very smart, calculating, and it takes a lot for the main character to figure out how to survive, let alone how to beat them. In Ready or Not, well, I won't lie, our main girl does need a lot of wits and strength to survive. But the family she's against, well, you'll see. As we keep going this year with horror comedies and the constructions, we get to one that I honestly have been wanting to talk about ever since it came out back in 2019. Just like Tucker and Dell vs. Evil, this one is at the construction of the trope of the most dangerous game idea. However, is it a bit subtler than Tucker and Dale, as this one does it deconstruction by playing the trope pretty much as it is. You will see what I mean. Written by Guy Busick and R. Christopher Monfrey, and directed by Matt Bettinelli Olpin and Tyler Gillett, Ready or Not was released in 2019, as I said, with the bad luck of being put in theaters against the Starfield Knives Out, which also showed a battle of the classes in a thriller setting, only that one leaning forward the cosy mystery, Agatha Christie style, while Ready or Not was horror, hence why I am talking about it here. Which meant it went a little bit ignored. Not to say that Ready or Not didn't have an amazing A-list cast. We're talking about Samara Weaving, Adam Brody, Mark O'Brien, Henry Sensley, and none other than the amazing Andy McDowell among them. And since I mentioned it, let's get it out of the way. There are some similitudes between Knives Out and Ready or Not right out of the gate. Both movies involve a big, rich family whose fortune comes from the actions of a patriarch, which means that the other members of the family are seen as a bit of hanger-ons who don't really did anything to deserve the money and, more importantly, feel entitled to it. There's an outsider coming in who comes from a completely different and far poorer background who is seen as lesser than the rest, especially as this outsider is getting part of the money that none of the family thinks that the outsider deserves. Oh, and there is a betrayal of the family tradition somewhere along the way. But that is the end of the similarities. Ready or not deals with the class war in a completely different way from the get-go. But before we get to that, let's do our usual mostly spoilerless summary of the plot, because ready or not, here I come. Grace and Alex Ledoma, 
have just gotten married despite the obvious protest of his family. See, the Ledomas Dominion are a family richer than God, in Grace's own words, who made their fortune by selling board games. On the other hand, Grace is an orphan who never had a family of her own and just happened to meet and fall in love with Alex when he was away from his family and trying to live a more normal life. The wedding is incredibly uncomfortable, despite supposedly being the happiest day of her life, as it's quite obvious to Grace that none of the Ledomas like her. Her new father-in-law openly says that his sons could have found a better wife. The wife of Alex's brothers, Daniel, says that she will never be one of them, to which a drunk Daniel replies, of course not, she has a soul. And the spinster Aunt Helene spends the whole wedding glaring at Grace, and if looks could kill, Grace would have been dead before saying, I do. But thanks to the kind advice of her new mother-in-law, Becky, Grace managed to soldier on. After all, as Becky says, the only one whose feelings matter here is Alex, and Alex loves her. But once the wedding is over, Alex informs her that there's a very special tradition that his family does every time someone joins. In honor of Mr. Le Bail, who helped their ancestor, Victor Le Domain, to begin the family business, they have to draw a card from Le Bail's puzzle box and play whatever game that it says. They all assure her that most of the games are harmless children's games and that she doesn't have to win to be accepted. Just to play. Grace follows the instructions and sure enough, she draws a card that reads Hide and Seek. Failing to notice the mood around the table changes a bit when she does, she offers a toast to Mr. LeBail and then proceeds to go and hide while the cheerful game songs play. What she doesn't see as she leaves the room is her new family grabbing weapons and getting ready to hunt her. Because see, the family is a tiny little bit cursed. Their fortune comes not from their business savvy, but from a literal deal with the devil, the aforementioned Mr. LeBail, which is a nice anagram for Belial. And thus, they have to give him regular sacrifices to keep the bloodline and the money going. Usually, a goat will do. But every time that the card hide and seek comes up during a wedding, and last time was 30 years ago, they have to hunt and kill the new member of the family, or else. Just like the cannibal hillbillies, the depraved rich are a staple of horror, and have been for a long time. Once again, we have the fear of the other. And yes, hey hey, I dare to say that in this case it's a bit more justified given what rich people do in real life. They may not hunt poor people for sport, at least not that we can prove, but they sure as hell made it hard for anyone who is not in their circle to just survive. Yes, the trope is so old that it began with the evil aristocrat idea and evolved more into either the noble rich become evil the moment they get money or the always corrupt corporate executive or banker. It is also not exclusive of to horror, of course. After all, evil queens are a staple of fairy tales, and you know that if the person has a title, even if the title is honorary, they will probably be betraying the hero at some point in an epic fantasy adventure. Especially if they are barons. Never trust a baron! And of course, they all are cunningly evil. After all, they have to present a facade of respectability to the rest of the world, even if the, every other aristocrat and rich person is equally evil. This is what usually separates the depraved rich aristocrat from the cannibal hillbilly. They both may have the same diet, because cannibal rich aristocrats are a thing and have been a thing in horror long before Count Dracula needed a real estate lawyer to move from his native land, but their methods to get their food is quite different. For a long time, we have had this idea in society that those who are richer are, by nature, smarter than those who have less. Obviously, it's not true. Money can't buy intelligence, even if it can buy a better education. But we still have that image of the genius millionaire like Lex Luthor, the sophisticated serial killer like Patrick Bateman, the conic politicians like Greg Stilson, and so on. But in real life, we also know that rich people 
are usually not the brightest crayons in the box, and I am not going to give real life examples here, but um, let's just say that what is happening on Twitter as I record this is a very good example of it. So this is what Ready or Not plays with. While the danger that Grace is in is very real, since the whole clan, except for her husband, who will not go directly against his family, but will do his best to give her an actual chance to survive by both not participating in the hunt and trying to sabotage the hunt when it happens, and another member of the family who may or may not be too drunk to actually care, the truth is that Ledomas are not exactly good at the most dangerous game. Half of them are not even sure that the course is true, so they only participate half-heartedly in the hunt. And uh, since the last time they actually had to hunt someone was 30 years prior to the movie's night, none of them have actual practice using the weapons they choose to hunt Grace with. I kid you not, the first three deaths in the movie are accidental, because the person shooting has no idea what to do with a crossbow. And I have to say that is one of the most realistic things I have ever seen in horror movies, where people apparently just learn to use a weapon the moment they touch it. Not even their butler, who as any god butler for the private rich family is also happy to join the hunt, is that competent. Sure, what he lacks in competence, he sure makes up by bloodthirstiness, but the point doesn't change that what Grace needs to beat her chasers is not impossible luck, but just to keep her head calm and be able to think before she acts. Because the rich guys, the family, don't think that much before they should. Or in short, rich people are just like everyone else. And in fact, their money may be more of a disadvantage since it makes them grow complacent and entitled, so they don't know how to make an effort to succeed at anything and when they are forced to do so, they fail. Again, not making any parallel with real life, but um, have you seen Twitter lately? Now, in our sweet trips through horror comedies, we have had the movie where the humor comes from the quips, and the movie where the humor comes from the fact that everyone is general savvy of the wrong genre. But here we have a comedy where the humor comes from the fact that the situation is completely and utterly absurd, even if all the characters treat it as deadly serious. We have a prologue where we see the end of the last hunt the family took part in, 30 years prior, and that one is played straight. A common thing in these horror comedies you may have noticed is that the prologue is always played straight. No laughs as we establish the situation we are in. And in the jump 30 years into the present day, we shared Grace's nervousness at the wedding, with her beloved Alex giving her one last chance to get out of it. Not that we or Grace know this. We only think at first that Alex means getting out of a stuffy traditional wedding where everyone seems to hate the bride, but that they can still be together and elope. She jokes, but we know that she's feeling anxious about the whole thing because of the class difference and how pretty much everyone in the wedding party is just the grown side. We know pretty early that she has no family or friends at this gathering and that they all tell her to her face that they believe she's nothing more than a gold digger who will never really be part of a family. This of course helps to summon the fact that the rich Ledomas do believe that they are in a different category for the people they look down onto. Even as later they explain their ancestors deal with devil and point out that they mostly sacrifice goats, we can believe that they would sacrifice a human being without remorse even if we had missed the prologue given how they treat Grace as less than human on the day she's marrying one of them. One of them who also happens to be the favorite son according to everybody. At first, we laugh because we are as uncomfortable as Grace whose smile first falls when she's not with Alex. Grace, who is forced to hide some of her habits and quirks because they would not be approved, and who looks like a lifeless doll in her own wedding day. But then the reveal is made. It's not that the family seems evil because they are rich, and boy, they don't even seem to love each other. All the snide comments that they make about Grace pale in comparison to the snide comments they made to each other about how much they despise themselves. 
it makes you wonder if the course that they are under is to have to be around each other all the time. It's that they are rich because they are evil. Nothing they have is due to hard work as everything was brought to them by a pact with the devil, or so they say. Here is the smartest thing about the movie if you ask me. It has been so long since the original deal that the family has forgotten if it was real or not. It could have been a fancy story that the founder told them to instill certain traditions within the family, or it could have been real, but as there were no other witnesses, no one knows for sure. And yet, they follow the deadly ritual like clockwork every time. They are told a horrible misfortune will fall upon them if they don't, but they don't know if that is true. In fact, one of them, a man who married into the family but was lucky enough not to draw the hide and seek card, pretty much says that he doesn't believe in the curse at all. He only participated in the sacrifices of goats to belong, and even then, he never questions the idea of killing Grace to keep his fortune going. Let that sink in. He doesn't believe that killing Grace will save him from a curse, because he doesn't believe that there is a curse. And yet, he's still picking up weapons with gusto in order to hunt the poor girl because, hey, he just wanted to belong. Which is, in fact, the attitude of the whole family. None of them really believe in the curse. There is no sign in the movie that the curse is real, as the family has never missed a sacrifice, so they don't really know if anything will happen if they miss one. And yet, greed makes it so that they never question the idea of killing someone, one of their own loved one to be precise, just in case they could lose part of said fortune if they don't. And isn't that a kicker? Ready or Not is an incredibly fun movie, but I must warn you, the fun comes from very dark humor since the situation in which Grace finds herself in is horrible no matter how you slice it. It's not just that she's being hunted by the family of her beloved or that her husband's help is very passive, rather than actively defending her or having warned her beforehand or even running away with her, he just deactivates a security system for afar and just watches, hopes that she will survive the night. It's that all she wanted in her life was to have a family. And when she got one, well, you know how it goes. Be careful what you wish for. I want to thank my dear patrons, Mitch Hyman, Elaine Ho, and Jessic, as well as my first supporter, Tanya Pineda, and the most amazing Amy Sunk, without whom none of my videos would be possible. I also want to remind you that if you want to support this and my other projects and get your name mentioned here, you can do so at patreon.com slash Adelisa, written link on the description, as I know my name can be hard to spell. And with just one USD a month, you will always be thanked in my videos, as well as get access to a ton of art before anyone else, and get the chance to suggest future subjects for videos. You can also support me through coffee, and for each coffee, you will get mentioned here in three future videos. If you can support me this way, I also accept likes, subscriptions to the channels, and of course, you sharing the links. I will also welcome all your questions, feedbacks, and suggestions in the comments below. This was Adalisa Sarate, and remember, there is not a problem in the horror genre that can be solved with more chances and a cup of good coffee.